Welcome everyone to the final installment of the 2015 Client Feedback Tool webinar series. Thank you all for taking some time out of your busy end of year to come hear a collection of some of the best ideas and insights I've gathered from a year of attending conferences, our own webinar series, and several other sources. While the rest of you who are uh, dialing in or getting set up, let me take care of just a little bit of housekeeping. If you are new to the GoToWebinar platform, on the right-hand side of the screen, you should see a control panel. If the control panel is big and covering your view of the window, there's a little right-hand arrow at the top that you can click to collapse and hide the control panel. If all you see is a tiny little control panel up at the top, there's a left-hand arrow you can click, which will expand the control panel to give you additional options. I tell you that because I do want to engage you, the audience, with questions throughout the course of the webinar. We've got 10 ideas here. Some of them are pretty different and broad, and I'd like to handle the questions as they come in as much as possible. So if any questions come up, do open up that control panel, pose your question, and I will do the best I can to answer those and work my answers into the flow of the webinar. I'll, of course, have a dedicated Q&A time at the very end. Please do stick around to the end and know that when we finish the webinar, I will reach out to each one of you with a feedback request to gather your feedback on what you learned and how well this presentation helped add value uh, uh, per your expectations. As we begin, I've got on the left side here the summary view of my top 10. Those of you who like to read or, in, or maybe hoping you don't have to take notes today, you'll see a URL at the bottom. If you look me up on LinkedIn, you can find some of the posts that I've published on LinkedIn, and I've got this list in concise form on LinkedIn. And what I've really tried to do today, I've, I've attended about a dozen conferences, dozens of sessions and breakup sessions at the conferences. We hosted our own conference this year and had a dozen great firms present some incredible ideas of how they're doing things in their business. I've traveled across the country visiting some of the top firms. I've also traveled with some really incredible consultants and had a lot of time on airplanes and other places talking about some great ideas in business. And of course, we've produced our own webinar series all year long. And I see from the registration list, many of you have been repeat visitors and attendees, and we certainly appreciate you continuing to see what we have to offer. And, and I'm glad to see that we're bringing you content that is high quality and drawing you back. What I've attempted to do is take it's probably about 100 hours of PDUs I've participated in over the course of the year and give you the highlights, the Cliff Notes version, in just about 60 minutes to 90 minutes. We do have 90 minutes set aside today. I imagine we'll be able to move fairly quickly. What I've also tried to accomplish today is take these 10 ideas that are a little bit discreet and, and not necessarily connected and craft into them a narrative that is logical and makes sense and really reveals the broader themes of what we here at Client Feedback Tool are passionate about. And that theme really is how do we as professionals create and capture value every day in all that we do. So what I think what you'll see in these top 10 ideas are a lot of insights best practices, techniques that are going to help you continuously create and capture value with your clients, with your employees, and with your business. So I'm going to start with a pretty bold statement and say there should be no hope in your next project. And this first concept uh, I came to with Darren Smith at SEMA Strategic, and you'll see this on all of my slides. I, I reference the expert or the guru on the slide and also link to a resource where you can see, in this case, a presentation by Darren. 
what I mean by there should be no hope in your next project is all too often we approach projects hoping that they're going to end successfully. And if we're approaching a project with not much more than a hope that it's going to end well, we probably aren't approaching the project as successfully and as expertly as we could. So what are the, some of the things we can do to replace hope with confidence? How are we going to confidently approach our next project and drive that project to success every time? Now, a lot of these ideas uh, might have had a genesis from someone like Darren. Please understand the words that I'm saying are my words. These are my perceptions and my angle on some of the conversations that I've had. So uh, don't use my words and put them in Darren's mouth. He certainly has all kinds of shades of gray that likely differ from mine. But these are some of the things that come out of what I've learned. Now, being a top 10 list, I imagine those of you attending are list makers. You like the bullet points. So I'm going to leave each one of these uh, 10 ideas and whittle them down to just a couple of bullet points to help you capture the ideas and hopefully take action on some of these. So first, don't hope. No. No going into your project that it's going to be successful. And how do you do that? How do you go about a project successfully every time? And if you uh, listen to Darren and read some of his content, he's got a great thriving group on LinkedIn. You'll find the theme that really comes out is this idea of collaborating. And we all think we know what collaborate means, but when you start to really understand a clear definition of what it means to collaborate, collaboration is more than coordination, it's more than cooperation. We're not just participating in a project together. True collaboration looks like all of us putting the team first. And this is internally with our internal collaborators. This is externally on a project with a clients and, and sub-consultants and, and peers and all the other players we're working with. And I'll make a, a Star Trek reference here. This is really that idea, the need of the many outweigh the need of the one. So when we set up collaboration effectively on a project and on a team, each person on the team is looking at the whole, at the unit, as the thing to, op to optimize and to drive to a better, higher outcome. And when we do that well, we end up with something Darren calls the best project ever experience. And the best project ever experience is more than on time, on budget, and profitable. And, and unfortunately, far too few of our projects have those outcomes. Uh, that should be the default outcome, on time, on budget, and, and uh, profitable. But the best project ever goes a step further. It's fun. It's satisfying. It's the kind of project, boy, we wish we could do over and over again. And it's the kind of people we wish we could work with all the time. So to start your process of replacing hope with confidence, what I'm going to encourage you to do is take some time and describe what the best project ever experience was. And then seek to understand what are the parameters, what are the, the qualities of that project and of that team that made it the best project ever. And then start asking yourself the question. If we did this once, and if we understand what created that outcome, why can't we do that more consistently? Why can't we do that all the time? And this leads to another idea, and I'm borrowing this idea from Tanya Salarvand and Ali Neem from VallejoCon. I saw them at a, a quality conference, service quality conference. And I had heard about this idea of client journey mapping but I've never really seen and understood the detail to, to what this does and how a client journey map can help. 
So once you've identified this idea of the best project ever and what created that experience, can you begin to visualize what that project looked like? And a client journey map really begins with the client. What is the experience the client has as they interact with you? How do they realize that they need you? How do they find out about you? How do they first encounter you, approach you, engage you? How do they engage your services? How do they start the project with you? How do they pay the bills and receive invoices? How do they close out the project? How do they operate whatever it is you designed or built or constructed for them? And understanding along the way that experience allows you to do some really incredible things. I've got an example on the screen, and, and these things do get pretty dense, particularly when it, you're dealing with a complex interaction like delivering a project with a professional service, like engineering, architecture, legal. But there are a few consistent components on a client journey map to understand. You've got your different touch points. What are the different touch points a client has when interacting with you? What is the client doing during those touch points? Getting the idea, planning their day, getting inside, what's next? And then what are their perspectives? Do they have any pain points? Do they have any highlights? What was something that really stood out as, as exciting or new or special? And what are some things that we internally can do to accelerate those highlights and to alleviate some of those pain points? And when you really understand what your client's journey is and you begin to put yourself in their shoes, it should drive some real empathy for the client experience. And I'm going to talk later on, some of the other points are uh, uh, referencing the criticality of what happens when you don't do this? And more importantly, what happens when you do and how businesses are being absolutely revolutionized, entire markets and sectors being turned upside down because some smart people got together and figured out what their client's journey was and they figured out ways to make that journey more effective, more efficient, and more satisfying. So if you're going to engage in a client journey map, it's a great thing to go Google. I've got a link down here that, that will pull up just a million images of different client journey maps. And I know most of you on this call today are coming from visual thinking backgrounds, so this should be a language that works well. But along the way, let's figure out at each point, what is your client thinking, feeling, and doing? Let's understand all three of those. I'm thinking this so that I can do this thing, and here's how I feel doing that thing along with you. When does the client have the greatest level of anxiety? Well, it might be right before that first invoice, and, and boy, is it going to be on target. Uh, understanding what those anxieties are puts you in the position to be able to address and possibly make those anxieties lesser, increasing confidence that things are going to go well. And it really helps you understand where your client is. Also, as you're developing a client journey map, seek to understand who are your clients interacting with and how are those interactions happening. You're going to have to go deep into your client organizations to understand this. Uh, uh, you may have multiple different touch points internally and externally. You've got your project people, you've got leadership and business development and key decision makers, you've got account payable and account receivable and all these other layers and facets of the relationship. So these relationships get pretty complex. And understanding where you have opportunities to improve the relationship at any one of those levels, optimizing those parts is only going to help optimize the whole. And the real question to begin asking yourself is where can you add value in every step? Where can you begin pushing against the status quo and really innovating to make the experience as positive and as easy as possible? And this, uh, uh, 
this exercise that you go through and, and digging in and measuring and looking, it's important that you go beyond just measuring and looking, but you really make a commitment to act. And organizationally, if you're going to map this out, begin taking responsibility for different elements and different aspects of the client journey. Now, I want to address that the client journey begins before you have a client. And Tim Samos from Circle S Studio shared this on a webinar with us a couple of months ago, that two-thirds of business-to-business -business deals are lost before a formal RFP process even begins. So two-thirds of the potential business you could pursue, you've already lost because the experience that, that they have learning about you isn't optimum. So Tim really talked about ways to drive that experience to be as optimum as possible. And his research and, and, and all the resources he shared really highlighted that content is king in the pre-sale experience with the client, marketing and business development, content is king. So what you want to do is really begin solving problems for your clients before through your client, before they even call you. On your website, are you talking all about yourself and your credentials and your locations and your history and your experience? Or are you presenting information that prospective clients can take and immediately begin getting value from the information. When you show potential clients that you will help them with their goals before they've even hired you to start helping them with their goals, when the information you're creating and publishing and sharing is helping them already, you become the natural fit. You become the perceived expert who's going to help them, who understands them, and they trust that after they've engaged you and they're paying you money, you're going to continue being focused on their goals because you've demonstrated in good faith a focus on their goals before the relationship even began. And that carries through from marketing into the business development and the sales cycle. Don't pitch. Don't don't go into an interview and talk about me, 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 and all of my credentials and my credibility and my history and my experience. Because that's what everybody does. Go into those situations focused on adding value. And uh, this is something we've really focused on heavily in my organization. My typical first call with a prospective client is really not much to do about me and what I do. It's a million questions about them and what they're trying to do. I'm really seeking to understand their business, and by asking the right kinds of questions the right kind of way, I'm, up, I'm consulting with them, and their answers are helping them see their business in new ways. And just, just conversing in the sales cycle is helping them understand their business and advance their business, even if they choose not to do business with us. But when you really stay focused on discovery and, and helping them solve their problems, they're much more inclined to want to do business with you because you're demonstrating this is how we operate. Your marketing is all focused on helping me solve my problems, understand what's going on. You're teaching me things, you're educating me, and I'm using what you're sharing to make myself better before we even talk. And then we start talking and the questions you're asking and how you're helping me understand my business and my goals. My business is getting better before I even bought. Well, of course, if you're doing that in marketing and sales, you're going to keep doing that for me once we've engaged. So it makes that path, that client journey, value added every step of the way. And then you do get the business. You've now engaged the client. You're working together on a project. And we can begin talking about ways to discover client delighters. And client delighters is an idea I borrowed from a Terry Reynolds over at Kleinfelder. 
Uh, Terry shared a story. Um, he lives in uh, California where, of course, the drought is a pretty serious a situation and wanted to landscape his backyard. So he got in a car and, and drove down to a, a big box a retailer that has a big garden center and walked around and looked through and certainly they had a little bit of everything and selection was not a problem. Pricing was certainly competitive and advantageous and by every metric they met his needs. They had everything required for him to work on his backyard. And Terry left and drove to a more regional uh, provider of, of services and uh, uh, um, garden center stuff and they had people standing around who were answering questions and really being a bit more hopeful and, and uh, able to engage the customers, which added some value and built some confidence that, that uh, um, this project was going to end well. And finally, Terry went down to a, a, a small mom and pop that, that was a local firm, had been there forever, and walked in the door and, and immediately someone walked and said, hey, uh, so what can we do to help? And Terry said, well, I'm getting ready to landscape my backyard and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I need to do. And the person working said, all right, well, if you have a few minutes and you drive back home, get out your uh, cell phone and just take a panoramic video of your backyard and then come back here and I'll take a look at that with you and we can figure it out. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. So Terry drove home, took the video, came back. And as this a person looked at the video, he began walking Terry through the store, pushing the cart, putting plants and other products on the cart for him, explaining exactly where each thing had to go, why it should go there, talking about color and balance and shade and, oh, look, there's a low spot over here, so you're going to have this kind of drainage, so we can put a, a, a plant that does better with water there, and this spot's going to be really dry, so let's put a dry area plant there. And, and Terry walked out with a cart full of stuff and a plan and more than anything, confidence that his backyard was going to look great, it was going to perform well, and it was just a delightful experience. It was new, it was different, really solved the problem differently than the other players were trying to solve the problem. So to understand client delighters, what Terry found is you really have to actively listen to your clients to pinpoint when and where these delighters are. They're happening, you've got some great employees and great staff, and they're doing things all the time that are surprising and delighting clients. The problem is those things are often happening in a vacuum and no one sees them, no one knows about them that project manager may not even know that he or she delighted the client. So an active process of listening to clients, gathering feedback, understanding when and where those things happened will help surface the discoveries that these delighters exist. And when you do that, organizationally, you can begin to capture and share those success stories. So that's something Terry is doing very uh, a carefully and purposefully at Klein Builder. Finding these success stories, sharing them across the organization, which is really building buzz around it. It's getting people talking about, huh, you know what, if everyone else is finding these client delighters and doing great things, I, I kind of want to be in on that party too. I want someone to tell my story, and it's getting more buy-in and more urgency amongst the staff to be a participant in the process of capturing these, these delighters. And this is really more my take on this, but I believe you can script amazing. And let me share an example from my experience and my background. A couple weeks ago I had a rather lengthy dentist appointment, about a two and a half hour dentist appointment, on my calendar for nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning. And on my way to the dentist at 8.20, I get a phone call from the dentist. 
and I answer, and the person on the other end goes, hey, Ryan, are you okay? I just wanted to check in and make sure things were all right. Well, yeah, I'm fine. Why? Well, your appointment started 20 minutes ago, and I know you've got a long drive, and it's really raining hard out there. I was just kind of worried about you that maybe something had gone wrong on your drive here. Oh, my appointment was at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock? Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, well, my mistake. And, of course, I had to reschedule and figure all of those components out. But to me, that was an amazing delighter as a patient at this dental practice. I had just missed a two-and-a-half-hour session, which probably threw their schedule into a bind. That's time they ended up not being able to sell. They probably could have sold it to someone else. Now their schedule's a mess, and they're having to reschedule me for a few days later and having to move things around. And really, I created a real problem for them. I, I cost them some revenue opportunity. Um, and their reaction to me wasn't, oh, man, what a pain. All right, what an inconvenience. I guess we can reschedule you. And it wasn't even, oh, no big deal. Don't worry about it. It happens all the time. It happens to the best of us. Ha, ha, ha. Their reaction was one of care and compassion that, that maybe something wasn't right. Now, I can tell that story, but you know what? So can they. And I shared this with the, 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 the dentist later because I wanted him to hear the story about what his receptionist had done, which I really thought was amazing. And you know what? You can script that. You can publish into your organization. Hey, when a client misses a meeting, instead of doing this or this, why don't you try this? And you can script what looks like compassion and care and empathy, and it might take some practice and some work. But that's a learning moment. You can teach people how to do these things. So look for those delighters, and don't just write them off as one-offs. Really seek to understand, is this something we can script? Is this something we can teach? Is this something we can work into our standard operating procedures? And really scale this across an organization. Otherwise, you've got these amazing gems that, that are just sitting out there that no one's taken advantage of. So as we move forward on these ideas, uh, we've talked about some of the positives here. I want to bring up some risk management strategies as part of this driving value to client. Uh, those of you who attended the, the webinar, we hosted a Tim Corbett from a Smart Risk, really solid, uh, information-filled, research-backed presentation, and there's no way I can do it justice in, in just five minutes. But as you think about your client journey, as you think about the experience that every one of your clients has with your organization and all of those touch points, communication is a fundamental key in each one of those touch points. The client's communicating with you, you're communicating with the client, and there's all of these interactions that are implicit rather than explicit, all these behind-the-scenes stuff where very likely communication isn't happening as regularly or as effectively as it could. And what Tim walked us through, what he shared with some of his research, and I'm rounding some of these numbers here, 80% uh, uh, of all loss claims in the AEC industry are non-technical in cause. Now with that, 33% of the caused claims are the result of a breakdown in communication. Either a miscommunication, a communication that should have happened, that didn't happen, the wrong kind of communication. So fully a third of the loss claims that are happening in the industry are because we're just not talking effectively. And I'll talk about why that happens on my next point. But what Tim has found is, is his concept of a higher performing firm. 
And these higher performing firms share a lot of similar attributes. There's things that these higher performing firms do with intention and with purpose that put them into a higher performing category. And communication is a, a foundational bedrock of that. Uh, whether it's a client feedback, whether it's a clearer contracts and scope, uh, uh, um, new processes around deliverables, a quality control checks, a lot of elements there of communication plans which are all driving these businesses towards higher performance towards the, the, the status of being a higher performing firm. And what these higher performing firms accomplish when they put these risk management strategies in place, typically about 30% fewer claims and about 300% higher profit than the average firm. So this communication is really key and not just minimizing problems, but really driving a better, more satisfying result, both for the client and for your organization. So why is communication so hard? What prevents us from communicating as openly and as effectively as we could? Some of the fundamental psychology and science behind this I heard from Michelle Brown over at Centus, and to summarize what I heard from her, uh, uh, biologically speaking, social status is a matter of survival. And thousands of years ago, when mankind was, was uh, much more primitive than we are now, the tribal unit was really vital to an individual's survival. And as a tribe, as a group, you could hunt together, you could protect each other, and therefore you could not die when a saber-toothed tiger attacked you, and, and you could survive because food and resources were available and shared as a community. And if you jeopardized your social status with your tribe, with your group, if the tribe rejected you and you were now on your own, your survival was, was severely impeded. Therefore, over millennia, the people who were predisposed to collaborate and be in community and to fear that social rejection were the ones who tended to be most successful and thrive and reproduce. So what's happened over generation after generation after generation is, is we are hardwired, literally hardwired, to fear our social status being jeopardized. So biologically, social status was a survival imperative. And I, I talked about that millennia ago. For some of us, it may have just been a couple decades ago in middle school. Certainly, social status feels like a survival imperative at certain points in our, our individual development. But what's really happening in the background is there's a neurochemical reaction when our social status is threatened. And you may have heard about some of these chemicals in our brain, uh, dopamine, which is a, a positive reactor, a cortisol, which is a stress reaction. And when our social status feels threatened, we have a cortisol reaction, which puts our brain into that raw, a fundamental fight or flight mode. So it's actually chemistry in our brain, it's chemicals moving around, triggering synapses to have the very strong reactions we have towards social status. The outcome of that is uh, uh, no one wants to be the messenger and bring bad news. Why? Well, because at points in history past, the bearer of bad news was sometimes shot. Uh, uh, so no one wants to be the bearer of bad news. No one wants to be the one to point out a flaw or, or risk saying there might be a problem over here. Because if you're wrong, then, then do you get laughed at or you ostracized? The whole social status begins to fall apart. And it's 
it's just biology. It's just chemicals moving around in your brain that are really causing that gut reaction you have and some of that fear that you have towards these interactions. And what's really interesting is with practice, you can actually change your brain. You can rewire yourself to react differently, not just emotionally, but biochemically. You can react differently to these situations. And I'll share an experience uh, from myself. I, I tend to be a bit of a thrill seeker. I, I tend to like uh, um, living on the edge. I get a dopamine response rather than a cortisol response doing fun, exciting things. But I still remember uh, probably the, the highest fear moment in my life from a pure physical survival level was the first time I went repelling. And there I was at the precipice of a 107-foot cliff. I had never been rappelling or rock climbing before. And even though I had seen all of these men come down the cliff and, and, and survive, and they assured me that there was physics and mechanics of how the ropes and the harnesses and all those pieces worked, it's a completely different matter when it's you in the harness and you have to walk backwards off the edge of a 100-foot cliff. Uh, that that was a high cortisol moment, and it took uh, a, a tremendous amount of mind over matter to to put myself on the edge, to lean back, and abandon my senses and fall down the side of the cliff. And once I got over the edge and I began going down, I felt firsthand that oh, this actually works. Oh, this really isn't hard. Actually, this is really kind of fun. And by the end of the day, I was up at the, end, at the edge of the cliff, and there was zero cortisol response, and instead it was just this huge dopamine hit. Boy, this is fun. And whereas I, I had previously approached that situation with tremendous fear and trepidation, and, and, and boy, it just took some grit to get over it, by the end, I was pushing my way up to the front of the line. I couldn't wait to go do this again. So when you're dealing with challenging social interactions, when you feel like your social status may be threatened, boy, if I say something, is that gonna, uh, is that gonna mean I don't get a promotion, or, or, uh, boy, did, does that make someone else look better than me? And, and boy, I don't want to admit fault here. I mean, I know it's kind of my fault, but I don't want to be the one who messed up. Uh, all those things that we deal with that that are driving very strong cortisol reactions. If we can go through it, encounter it, and look for the positive end, understanding that really in 21st century mankind, at least those of you who have the resources to be on the webinar today, you're not gonna die. Those fundamental reactions we have are millennia old. They, they don't really apply anymore. So let's not let our biology and our chemistry get in the way from really being smart with how we engage and react with each other. And pushing this a little bit further, uh, I encountered Jia Zhang at Wuju Learning, and some of you may have heard about the uh, Krispy Kreme donut experiment. This went viral about three years ago, and Jia has written a wonderful book called Rejection Proof. If you haven't read it, you owe, your, you owe it to yourself to spend two hours and read the book. Jia takes this idea a little closer to home and really focuses very specifically on our fundamental fear of rejection and, and how what we do in life and how we approach the world is so shaped by our own insecurities and very specifically our own fear of being rejected by someone else. And Jaw tells his story how um, uh, he always wanted to be an entrepreneur when he grew up, always wanted to start his own business. And uh, as he aged and went to school and got an MBA and got a great job at a Fortune 500 company and, and had the wife and the house and his first kid on the way and by all external metrics appeared to be successful, but was really miserable 
because he wasn't living his dream. Unfortunately for him, he had a, a wife who, who recognized his unhappiness, and even though their first child was due to be born in, in just a matter of months, said, hey, look, uh, if not now, when? So why don't you stop this madness, take six months, and go start your business. Uh, you've been smart, we've saved, we can afford it, go start your business. And so he, he did the unthinkable and quit his great job and started a, a startup. And four months in, they kind of had their first product and things were starting to look good, but you know, there's only so much money there. And he had been pursuing some investment from a venture capitalist, and, uh, really felt good about it, was just waiting for the final confirmation and at his birthday dinner out one night with all of his friends, got an email from the, the, the investor that simply said, no thanks, we'll pass. And that rejection almost unhinged him. And and boy, I, what was I doing? And, and I had a great job and I just spent all of our savings and, and what was I thinking? Fortunately, again, his wife encouraged him to persist and not give up just yet. So he spent some time researching rejection and, and why did that rejection cause him so much anxiety and, and nearly cause him to give up? It was a single rejection. Why did that rejection nearly cause him to give up on his dream? That's really powerful when you put it in that perspective, that a single rejection can cause a human being to give up on their life's dream. And he found some of these same things, like what I just shared from Michelle Brown at Centis, uh, some of this a biological imperative towards rejection, and discovered a uh, psychologist in Canada who had developed a rejection therapy program. So Ja, being a high achiever and ambitious, decides, you know what, I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to practice getting rejected so that I can desensitize and retrain myself to not fear rejection. And uh, uh, I'm really going to push it. I'm going to do hard things. I'm going to do 100 days of this. And to hold myself accountable, I'm going to film it with my iPhone and blog about it every day. And day three changed his life. These donuts that you see, these donuts changed his life. He uh, uh, went to a Krispy Kreme expecting to get rejected. Again, that was what his experiment was all about, was to practice getting rejected. And he asked Jackie, the, the, the cashier at the Krispy Kreme, I would like a box of donuts shaped like the Olympic rings. And instead of a no, he got a yes. And 15 minutes later, he walked out of Krispy Kreme with donuts. She didn't even charge him for it. She gave him a hug. It was this really cool moment. He posted it on YouTube and it went viral. It went everywhere, over three million views. It was picked up by CNN and MSNBC. And all of a sudden, he became an overnight sensation. And now, three years later, it's had staying power. So he now has his own business. He's a rejection guru. He's written a book. And he's accomplished some amazing things in life because he wasn't afraid to get rejected. So the moral of the story, some of the lessons he teaches, and I'm skipping a lot of the stuff in between, but these are some points to track and, and to understand. Rejection is an opinion. Rejection is a human opinion. And if someone rejects you or your idea, the rejection is that person's. It's not yours. It's not the idea that doesn't have merit. It's not you that don't have merit. It's that what you're offering just isn't a match or isn't valued by the person that you offered it to or, or asked of. And in fact, rejection does have a number. If you ask enough people or if you ask enough times, eventually you will find a yes. So one of his techniques for managing rejection is if you have a big ask, put a number on it. And don't go or don't stop until you reach that number. But be practical. Once you hit that number, if it's still a no, then move on to whatever's next. Another key point here is don't reject yourself before you give someone else the chance to reject you. And uh, 
Uh, this is a really tough one because you've got to look inward at yourself and really hold yourself accountable to this. And how many of us, when dealing with the client or facing a tough situation, will reject ourselves before we give the client a chance? I was talking with a, a firm owner just a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Kathy, and she said, yeah, I hadn't raised my personal rates in about six years, seven years, and, um, you know, I was just, boy, it's tough, and, and uh, finally I decided to give myself a $5 an hour raise on my hourly rates for my clients, and, and I just did it with one client, and, um, boy, it was so hard to do and they never said anything about it. It's like they didn't even notice. They just paid the bills. So all those years that Kathy was not giving herself that $5 an hour bump in the hourly rate was years of opportunity lost because she had rejected herself. She had simply assumed someone else would reject her, so, so she, she rejected herself first. Give yourself the opportunity to win. You'll never get the yes if you don't try if you don't ask. I put some of these things into practice myself uh, and, and really simple stuff and if you like me and you like practical outcomes, you know, I'm not going to stop at a Krispy Kreme and ask for Olympic donuts because that doesn't have any practical value to me, uh, but I remember shortly after encountering this idea, I went out to Arby's and I've got four kids and, and I don't need a discount, but I'm practicing, and so I asked the guy, hey, do you have the uh, four-kid discount? Yep, and he pressed a button and took 10% off the order. I mean, just like that. He didn't give me a crazy look. He didn't look at me weird or, or, or question or negotiate me. He just kind of smiled and goes, yep, and he pressed a button, and I saved a two and a half bucks. It, it, and it wasn't about the two and a half dollars. It was about overcoming the fear to ask. So it's amazing when you start doing those things. That began to inspire some confidence, so my asks got bigger. I spent a week in Southern California with my wife on vacation, and uh, um, I had rented the base level car, but when I was there, I said, hey, you got the free upgrade to the Mustang convertible? We're going to be in California for a week, sure it would be nice to drive around with the top down. Uh, well, I can't do free, but instead of a $600 upgrade, I can do it for 100 Okay. So practice some rejection, and if you need an incentive to do it, find some things that matter to you. Get your discount at the Arby's. Ask for the upgrade when you rent a car or check into a hotel. I've gotten so many corner suites at no extra cost. I ask every time I check into a hotel for the, the, the free upgrade. It's amazing if you just ask. If you just put yourself out there, you'll get. And you know what? What's the worst? They say, nope, can't do it. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I, I don't expect them to do it. It's not their job to just give stuff away. So there's really nothing lost. It costs you nothing to just ask. So practice where it's easy and it's safe, and then set yourself up for some bigger, more important asks, like that change order that the client just asks for a bunch of extra work, and it's going to cost a bunch of extra time and money. And instead of losing it on your margin, ask with confidence. And when you do experience a rejection, understand the why that's behind it. Every time there's a no, seek to understand why. Why not? And you don't have to be impertinent or rude with understanding the why, but approach the no with some real curiosity. Huh, well, why not? Oh, well, sir, I can't give you the corner suite upgrade because we've got a conference and so all the corner suites have already been booked. Oh, okay. So you're not rejecting me. You're not saying no to me. You can't say yes because they're all reserved. All right. Easy to understand. And oftentimes when you ask someone why they said no and they start explaining to you, they'll realize, you know, there's no reason for my no. And the no will become a, sure, why not? And you can use that process to get to more yeses. Which leads to this idea, if we're going to start asking why, how do we ask 
why and better ways? And what other kinds of questions can we ask to more precisely understand a situation that we're in? Or to more precisely understand a client's wants and needs? So this idea of precise questions matter, I pulled this from Bob Stocking over at Vervago. And I actually pulled Bob to do a day-long workshop with my whole team uh, uh, in January. Really amazing stuff that Bob does. And Bob focuses on helping people learn to communicate more concisely and more effectively. And that's done by precise questioning and concise answering of those questions. So what Vervago has put together is a taxonomy of different kinds of questions. Why are we here? Focusing type questions, a clarification, what do you mean by this? Uh, assumptions, evidence, causes, effects, action. And then giving some techniques and some processes to go from the general, what do you mean, to a more precise question. By this, did you mean A or did you mean B? Let me make sure I understand. So it's a much more precise way to ask a question than the general, what do you mean? And when you begin putting these tools into practice, asking well will begin improving communication. By asking the right question, you're going to get the information that you're looking for more easily, more quickly. And when you're focused on asking good questions, it changes your focus in how you listen. And because you're being intentional in what you ask and how you ask, you're listening to understand rather than listening to respond. And you all know what I'm talking about. You've all been around those people who, uh, uh, while you're talking, you can see all they have on their mind is what they're going to say next and you know they're just not quite engaged and just quite listening to what you're saying. And we're all guilty of it, and, and I'm probably a big offender of it. That's why this is one of my favorite things I learned this year, because it's, it's a tool and a process that has helped me learn to listen for understanding rather than to respond. And one of the great ways to do that, I have found I can ask a question, and when someone responds, I can ask one of these more precise questions. So what I heard you say is this. Now by that, did you mean this or did you mean that? And it's amazing when I start asking one or two or three questions about the question I already asked, and I start uncovering some of those layers, how much more true and accurate their answer becomes. And corollary to that, how much more true and accurate my understanding of what matters to them becomes. It's, it's, it's definitely a technique, and some people are born with it. I was not one of those born with it. But it is something you can, with intention, put into practice. You just need a framework, and you need uh, uh, to challenge yourself, to set some goals for yourself to ask. One of the ways I do that, I am not naturally a note taker, but when I am early on in the process with a prospective client or a new client, my focus is to fill two pages of notes with their words. And if I gotta fill two pages of notes with their words, I can't be talking, because while I'm talking, I, I'm not writing down what I'm saying. So I've, I, I'm setting metrics for myself, which is driving me to ask questions, to listen carefully so I can put down on paper what they said, and I bring a pen and a highlighter. And as we're wrapping up the meeting, I'll just ask for a moment and glance down at what I've written. I'll highlight the three, four, five really key ideas, and then before leaving the meeting, I will repeat back to them. So what I heard you say was, these are the four things that matter most. This, 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 and this. And in that context, at the end of the meeting, it's amazing how often they'll come back and say, yeah, let me shade each one of those just a little bit differently. 
and you get more layers of understanding, which means you can solve their problems so much more expertly because you really get what they're trying to accomplish. And to enable that to happen, in order to ask and ask a lot of questions and have time to let them talk, when they ask me questions, I need to be able to answer concisely and directly. And that's, again, not something I was born with. It's not a natural thing I do, but it is a skill I've been more and more effective at developing over the course of the year, ever since I've worked with Bob and, and put some of his techniques into play. Very often people will ask a yes or no question. And they're not really wanting a simple yes or no. They want a little bit of a context around it. But our natural reaction tends to be to give the context before giving the yes or the no. And often we'll get off on a side trail and never get around to the yes or the no. What Vervago promotes is when there's a yes or no question, immediately answer yes or no. And if you need to be thoughtful about it for a moment, Indicate that you're being thoughtful, and then answer, yes, and here's why, no. And let me give you some background on, on why not. So you're answering concisely and directly, so they know. All of a sudden, they can pay attention to what you're saying rather than have to figure out, are you saying yes, are you saying no, and, and if you don't answer the question that they ask, they're listening at a different level than if you had just gone ahead and been direct and given them the answer they were looking for. And when you do get to any expository information beyond the simple answer, as a technique and a practice to, to force your answers into brevity, tell them what you're going to tell them. No. And let me tell you three reasons why not. First, and give a bullet point. Second, and then your bullet point. Third, and then your bullet point. Are there any of these we need to talk about in more detail? And you can answer a question really, really concisely that way, which means you have more air time to ask them questions and hear them talk and better understand them. Meanwhile, they're listening to you with rapt attention because you're giving them exactly what they asked for. And all of these first eight points lead up to the final two. These are really the culmination, and in many ways, they're almost the same thing. Jeff Colvin at Fortune Magazine uh, back in October wrote an amazing article, The 21st Century Corporation and New Business Models, link you see on the screen. And the article really talks about being a frictionless business and how the new world order in business is about frictionless. And he talks about frictionless labor, frictionless uh, capital, frictionless uh, clients. How easy can you make it for a business to happen? That's going to be what really differentiates the new world. So. Let's talk about frictionless. By frictionless, we mean removing any impediment to engaging in some interaction. We're removing impediments for the transfer of capital, the transfer of money from a buyer to a seller. We're making it easy, transparent, uh, um, slippery. It, it, it's just going to happen. Now let's talk about why this really matters. If you as a company can be disruptively easy to do business with, you will dramatically change your market. And you may think, oh, I'm a hundred person and multidiscipline engineering firm and there's you know, a thousand of us out there, so how am I going to change that market? Oh, you know what? Your market is who your clients think you compete with. That's your market. Your market is probably a whole lot smaller than you really think it is. And you have the opportunity in that smaller pond to dramatically change the dynamics of your market. 
you're not going to do that with expertise. You're not going to do that with brand and 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 um, uh, uh, size and all these things. You're going to do that disruptively by being easy to do business with. Let me share a couple of examples. You're driving down the street and the uh, gas light in your car comes on and you're on the way to work. And there's a gas station on the right and a gas station on the left. What gas station are you going to stop at? 90% of the time, you're going to stop at the gas station on the right because it's a right-hand turn. When you're done, you pull back out and you turn right with traffic back into your lane. It's easy. You're not going to turn left across traffic to then get to a gas station so that when you have to leave, you've got to cut left again across traffic and try to shoot the gap. It's hard. You don't care if it's a three cents more expensive on the right-hand side versus the left-hand side. The frictionless economy tells us you're going to go to where the business is easy. And then a week later, you're leaving work and the gas light comes on. What gas station are you going to go to? Well, you're going to go to the one that's on the other side of the street. On the way home, that one's going to be on the right. So you don't really have loyalty to the gas station. You've got loyalty to what's easy. You don't have loyalty to saving three cents a gallon. You have loyalty to what's simple. And this is going to be a tough concept. This is a tough challenge for professional services businesses. And I don't know that I have all the answers. And, and it's something I am continuing to seek understanding and clarity on my business and what I do and how I do it. But what if you took the mental capacity of your people? You guys are professional service providers. You got some really smart people that have some incredible education, you're creative, you solve problems, you got some brilliant, brilliant brain trust there. What if you focused a portion of that energy on disrupting the way clients do business with you? What if you re-engineered the process of consuming your services and do it differently than anybody else and make it so easy that they wouldn't possibly want to go across the street to someone else. Now you're not commodity. Now you're not competing on price. You're competing on easy. And so few businesses are doing that. So that allows you to differentiate with low friction delivery. And that happens before the sale. Are you easy to engage with? What's your contract process like? How hard is it to actually do business with you? What does the invoicing process look like? How hard is it to pay you? Uh, um, what if we could just really simplify all of those elements so that it's a delight? We've talked about delighters. It's a delight to do business with you because it just, it just works. A great example of this is the way Uber has revolutionized the transportation industry. In fact, Uber, from a market capitalization perspective, is now the largest transportation company in the world. And you know what? They don't own a single car. Uber understood that, uh, um, you know, maybe in downtown New York, it's still really easy to jump in a cab and go from point A to point B. Uh, um, but in a lot of markets, it, it's, it's kind of a pain getting from somewhere to somewhere else. If you don't have a car, if you're waiting for a cab, and gosh, there's 17 cab companies, and who do I call, and, and where do I meet them, and, and all this anxiety and frustration around just getting into a car to go somewhere. It's not even about the car itself or, or the fees and fares paid. So Uber said, you know what, there's got to be a better way. And they've completely obliterated that market by delivering things differently, by making it easy to do. Now I travel quite a bit and when I land at an airport and I walk out, I'm not going to call an Uber because there's a whole line of cabs waiting right there. I walk up to the one first in line, sit down, and it takes me to my destination. It's easy. It's a little friction. But once I'm there, I don't see another cab for the rest of the trip. And let me talk to you about a specific example of how I personally got to started with Uber, and it's about being frictionless before 
we even start doing business together. I was up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, working with a client, and a meeting ended. I had two hours to go from Cambridge to actually taking off of the runway, which left me an hour to get from Cambridge to the airport, an hour to get through the airport onto the plane. Perfect timing. And on the way out of my client's office, I asked the receptionist to call me a cab, and she kind of looks at me and okay, I guess, and so she's thumbing through the phone book trying to find a cab and calls, and it's going to be an hour and a half to get a cab. And she calls two other cab companies, and they're all saying the same thing, hour and a half to get a cab. And I'm doing the math. I, I'm going to miss my plane. I'm not going to be able to get home. So I'm standing outside the client, kind of waiting, tapping my toe, frustrated, anxious, and I remember, oh, yeah, there's this Uber thing. Let me try that out. Look it up, find it in the app store. Within five minutes, I had signed up. I had entered my payment information. I had tapped where my location was, and there was a, a black Mercedes 500 sitting in front of me, ready to take me to the airport. Five minutes from the moment I had the idea, maybe I should try Uber, until I was sitting in one. It was frictionless. It was so easy. The cab company was so high friction, I didn't even know who to call to cancel the cab. So there was probably some poor cabbie sitting there wondering where the heck I was. But they just made it hard. They just made it hard. So the, the real challenge here is how can we rethink our businesses? How can we rethink how we do things as an industry to become more and more frictionless. And the final idea I'm going to share today comes from Nir Isle from Near and Far Consulting. And Nir wrote a book uh, called The Hook, and it's all about these modern habit-forming businesses. And here's particular interest, particular focus is in the, the software world, particularly social and apps and, and all those things that you get addicted to on your cell phones. And I'll share a little background about that so we understand what we mean by a habit-forming business before I switch and put the challenge out there that I think we can do the same thing in professional services. So let's take something like Facebook as an example. And these habit-forming businesses all follow a predictable pattern. Facebook, there is some kind of a trigger. The process always begins at the trigger. And in the early days, I started getting friend requests on Facebook and I was a bit of a holdout on the whole idea. My wife was on, a bunch of family was on, and uh, I just kept getting Facebook friend requests delivered to my email and uh, ignored them, ignored them, ignored them. Meanwhile, I'm struggling to keep up a blog with pictures of the kids because all my family wants pictures of the kids. And, and finally, I just give up. And one day, I get that friend request. Um, and I say, all right, I guess I'm going to sign up. And you know what? That led to an action. Within the email I got with the friend request, a simple click, simple click, and I had to type in my first name, last name, my age, my email address, and my city. That was it. Simple. And as soon as I did, I was met with an immediate reward. Not page after page of, of forms and all about you and, and all this other stuff. I immediately received a reward. And the reward was all those people who had sent me friend requests over the last a couple of years, they were just in my feed. And I, I didn't really know what a feed was. I was kind of new to this whole social thing. But there they were. And their lives and what matters and their pictures and their jokes were all just right there. And huh, this is really interesting. It was rewarding. I, I immediately got something for my effort. I got to kind of see and, and the reason why reality TV works is because we all have this natural voyeuristic tendency to want to see what's happening in the world around us and 
and people we know and care about. So that, that need was satisfied. Which caused me to immediately begin investing in the platform. So I'm scrolling through and and looking and, and I see an old friend who I hadn't talked to in years and he had said something funny, so I I posted a comment on his thing, which led to a trigger and someone liked my comment. And all I had to do was click to see which comment was I made. And I was rewarded because I felt validated. Somebody liked something I said. That's that's validating, that's rewarding. That's the opposite of that fear of social status. My social status just increased. Somebody liked something I said. It was a cortisol reaction. It was rewarding. So I invested more in the platform and engaged in conversation. And over time, those triggers that start the behavior, which initially are external triggers, someone, something out there is telling me to act, I've now developed a habit and no one has to tell me. And the next time I see a funny license plate, like yesterday I saw a Hummer and the license plate was MPG LOL. Snapped the picture of it and threw it on Facebook. You know why? It was funny. And and I thought it was. I've got an awful sense of humor, so don't take my word for it, but I thought it was fun and clever. And you know what? My network, my social world, they kind of get me, and the reason why we're friends is because we like some of the same kind of things. And People started commenting on that and liking it, and I felt validated. So no one tells me to invest in the platform anymore. My trigger is now internal because I've built a habit around using this social media tool. So the, the challenge I'm laying out there, and again, these are some things I've been working on for my business. I don't know that I've got them all figured out yet, but these are definitely uh, uh, things I'm still thinking about and working on and trying to figure out how me and my business and you and your business, how we as an industry of professional service providers can create some habits. So an example, how do we get clients in the habit of engaging us for business? What are some of the triggers that we can put out there? And probably a lot of those triggers Go back to that content is king comment. Can we put some great content out there that is a trigger with simple actions? And those simple actions should lead to clear rewards, which causes our potential clients to invest in communication and relationship with us, which means we eventually secure their business. A great example, a, a firm that I worked with, I heard from a client, you know what, it'd be great if you would just send someone by our office a little bit more often. Okay, so they just started sending someone by the office a couple times a week. And what happened was the client got in the habit of seeing a project manager on a regular basis. And the client developed a habit of talking to the project manager about stuff he's working on. And the project manager, being no dummy, says, huh, sounds like you're working on that. I think I can help you with that, which is a rewarding experience for the client because, hey, I got someone helping me now. And over a nine-month period, the revenue in that client increased 300% because they were developing new habits, new habits around how they engage. They were really being frictionless. They were meeting the client literally where the client was and making it so easy to help them with their work by physically being there. So that was a frictionless shift in the business model, which developed new habits of engagement, which means this one engineering company tripled the revenue coming from that client, which really means they took a lot of work away from other firms. They began to dramatically shift that little sector of the market by being creative and insightful and operating your business just a little bit differently. On the same hand, we also want to nurture internal client advocacy habits. It's not enough to, to, to just turn our clients on to the habit of doing business with us. 
we really have to start internally and develop a culture of client advocacy with our own employees. So what are some of the things you can do as leaders to nurture good habits of client advocacy? What triggers can you put out there that cause your people to take action? And that action should be typically driving some kind of a conversation with their clients because those conversations will almost always present rewards. Talking to a client nine times out of ten, you're going to learn something, you're going to discover something, you're going to make the project better, make the relationship better, you're going to find new opportunities for work and help which is going to drive up revenue and drive up margins. And when your staff start seeing that they invest more and more into those tools of communication and client advocacy and it begins to repeat and cycle and scale across an entire organization so that you now have instead of one CEO just beating the drum of uh, grow the business and take care of clients, you got an army of smart, savvy professionals focused on creating value with their clients and with each other, with each other every day. And with both your clients and with your internal staff to make this work, provide immediate relevant rewards. And most of the times, those rewards are not going to be financial. We're not dangling out $50 bonuses or $1,000 bonuses for doing what's smart. It's acknowledgement and, and, and those internal intrinsic rewards. We talked about the cortisol stress reactions and we talked about the opposite, which is those dopamine reactions, those pleasure moments. What are some things that are happening just naturally, socially, relationally inside the interactions of your teams and your projects and your client organizations that just feel good, it feels right, and it's personally satisfying, and you're reaching a deeper level of engagement, understanding, and awareness on that reward mechanism. And that's what's going to build habits because, you know what, I just get hooked on this. I get addicted to having conversations with my clients and to hearing that things are going well and to finding problems while they're small and taking action on them and saving the day and being acknowledged for being smart and savvy and, and seeing that. That's all amazing stuff that when you set that culture in place, these habits will begin to develop and perpetuate themselves. So what would your business look like if you accomplished these things, if you put these 10 tips into play? What starts changing about your business? Well, you're going to end up with fearless employees habitually adding value to their clients and to your business. You will have addicted clients bringing you work as fast as you can take it because they're in the habit of working with you and you've made it so easy for them. Going anywhere else is just going to be harder. So they're going to come to you. And you're going to have energized firm leaders who are creating new market realities on your terms. You're not going to be reacting to the market realities. Another example from that frictionless business model when Airbnb, another one of those big disruptors in, in uh, uh, short-term housing and hotels and all that, Airbnb, just regular people have rooms in their houses and, and people can rent them out and, and it's just a frictionless way for people to travel and save money. And Airbnb was one of these energized leaders that created a new market reality. Well, when Airbnb came to Austin, Texas, within a couple of months, the average hotel price in Austin had dropped 8 to 10%. So those who are not on the front end energetically leading and creating new market realities are on the tail end reacting to them. And oftentimes that person who's stuck in the reaction mode has very little to react to other than becoming more and more commoditized and losing value and losing margin. So don't be a follower. Get ahead of that in 2016 and define the market reality you want to see. And when you do this, at the end of the day, when you're lying in bed at night, you've got real peace of mind. You're not hoping that your projects are going to be successful. 
you know they're going to be successful. You're not hoping that your clients have a good experience because you've mapped it out and you know what kind of experience they're going to have. And you're delivering value even to people who aren't your clients yet. And your clients are being delighted and you know when and where and how and you're making that happen. And your, your staff are communicating effectively and so problems one, they're not going to happen as often, and when they do, you're going to find them and fix them before they become big. And your staff are going to just just uh, take risks, and they're going to approach problems and challenging clients with confidence and enthusiasm. And they're going to be communicating clearly and asking questions and really driving your business to just be better, to be easier. And you'll sleep with peace of mind knowing that business is good. That's the power of these 10 things. I mentioned at the beginning, the theme here really is finding ways to create and capture value in and around your business. And I hope you've seen those themes as well. So as we are wrapping up, I'd like to ask you if you have any questions, any thoughts, uh, questions, or if you have any ideas of your own that maybe I didn't capture in this top 10 list. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what are the best ideas you've heard? Uh, which of these ideas do you think is the strongest? What questions do you have? So we'll take just a minute here for questions to start coming in if there's any questions. And while we wait for any of those, if there are any, again, please know that uh, uh, I do very much want to hear from each of you uh, which of these ideas was strongest, what was most helpful, what you found, maybe challenging, maybe off target, maybe inspiring. So do look for a feedback request coming from me in the next 24 hours, and do know uh, uh, feedback is one tool I use to do a lot of these 10 things, to start those conversations, look for friction points, and start adding value uh, 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 every step of the way. So I'm seeing some great comments coming in so far, some thank yous and acknowledgments that things were very good. I, I very much appreciate that and like that acknowledgement. Let's see, I see someone else uh, typing in a question now. Um, no, sounds like more uh, comments. So uh, perhaps I answered all the questions proactively. Uh, if anyone would like a copy of the slides, what I did on each slide, just to, to recap, I have not only the 10 points, I've got a few bullet points on each, and then at the bottom I've got the reference and a relevant additional resource. In this case, there's a 15-minute TED Talk from near, really fascinating. So you can identify, connect with on LinkedIn, these professionals, see some of the resources they've put together, and really take some of this learning to the next level. Several of these topics we do have videos on on our YouTube channel, so you may see a few of those as well. Thank you all for sticking around. I appreciate it very much. Uh, look forward to talking to you again in 2016 and bringing you a whole new year of great ideas, great insights, and look forward to another recap and the 10 best ideas a year from now. Thank you.